Hi everyone and welcome back to Neuropsychology. So today we're going to start off with a new chapter about spatial behavior. And in this video, we are going to talk about the intro to spatial behavior, four types of space, topographic disorientation, and some of examples of it, and the dorsal and ventral streams in the brain. Okay, so spatial behavior refers to all of the behaviors that we and other animals use to guide our bodies through space. So topographic memory is our ability to move through space from one place to another. So this comes from the idea that movements take place between and also in relation to points or objects that are spatially distinct. So the word topography refers to map ma making. And scientists O'Keefe and Nadell have stated that as we or other animals, as we travel, we create these brain representations of the environment in our head in the form of a cognitive map. So we then use these maps to guide new trips through the same environment. The idea is that um, when we use these cognitive maps, we use them to navigate in space, which makes sense because these maps offer simple representation of a lot of information. So imagine your house. So I got this picture of the internet. It's a very simple house. But imagine your house. And imagine um, what it looks like. Could you abstractly draw out where your kitchen is or where your bathroom is and how to navigate th um, to them or through them from where you're sitting now? So if you could, you just imagined your cognitive map of your house. Okay, so we can break um, space up in four subspaces. The first one is body space. In this space, um, it's everything on your body. So where your clothing is, for example. Another subspace is grasping space. And this is a space closely around your body. So everywhere where you can grasp with your arms or where you can move your legs into. Right outside of that, you have the distal space. So this is a space your body can move into or out of. And then the last one is time space. Um, this is the past and your future and your present. So we need time space for auto noetic awareness, which is the self-knowledge that allows someone to bind together the awareness of oneself as a continuous entity through time. So here's a little recap of the four spaces. So body space, everything on your body. Grasping space, everything you can reach with your arms. And there should be a bubble right here too. So everything you can reach with your legs as well. Distal space, everything outside of that, which is where you can um, move your body in and out of. And time space is the future or the past. Okay, so let's go over some clinical descriptions of spatial impairment. So after a head injury, there is a high likelihood to obtain topographic disorientation. And topographic disorientation is a disability in finding your way in environmental cues. So even if those environmental cues were familiar to you before the injury. For example, if someone with topographic disorientation is blindfolded in their own home, often they will not know to point to the furniture. So if you ask them to point at the TV or the couch, they will have difficulty doing so. Multiple variations in symptoms of topographic disorientation have been described. Some patients are unable to name buildings or landmarks that used to be familiar to them. Others might retain this ability. Some patients can still describe routes and draw out maps, but become disoriented when they actually visit these actual locations. And sometimes people will have difficulties with calculating how far items are from them. So topographic disorientation can occur um, because someone cannot recognize previously familiar landmarks or cannot compute the relationship between landmarks or when someone is impaired in spatial guidance. So any form of topographic disorientation can, uh, can occur as anterograde or retrograde spatial impairment. So people that lose the ability to navigate 
in environments that were familiar before their injuries receive or get retrograde spatial amnesia right here. So this is the time of the injury and they will not remember anything that happened before that. People who can still navigate in environments that were familiar but cannot navigate in new environments have anterograde spatial amnesia. So again, this is the time point of the injury. They remember everything before. They just cannot make new memories. Sometimes patients have both retrograde and anterograde spatial amnesia. So let's go over some examples of selective defici uh, deficits of topographic disorientation. So these are five examples that I wanted to go over. Um, so egocentric disorientation, heading disorientation, landmark agnosia, anterograde disorientation and spatial distortions. Okay, let's start with the first one. So when someone has egocentric disorientation, that patient will have difficulty perceiving the relative location of objects with respect to where they are, so with respect to themselves. So they either have um, unilateral or bilateral injuries to the posterior parietal cortex. So often these patients can still gesture towards objects as long as their eyes are open. But when they close their eyes, this ability is completely lost. So people with egocentric disorientation will have impairment on a lot of visual spatial tasks as well. So for example, um, they will have impairments on rotations so or mental rotation. So for example, to imagine a dice rotating in your head, they will not be able to do this. They will also have difficulties in um, judging distances between objects. Okay, the next one up is heading disorientation. So here, patients are unable to set a course to where they want to go, even though they are able to recognize landmarks and often recognize their own location. So you can kind of describe this as not having a sense of direction. And often this injury or this condition is associated with injury to the right posterior cingulate cortex. Okay, third up is landmark agnosia. So when someone has landmark agnosia, they are unable to use environment futures to orient themselves. So they can recognize, for example, a house or a church. And they often do not have a deficit in perceiving environmental information but they cannot use a particular environmental cue, such as a church, to guide their movement. So the lesion that is often associated with this is a bilateral or only on the right side of the medial aspect of the occipital lobe. So all the way in the back of the brain. So the fourth one is anterograde disorientation. So here patients have no problem navigating in formerly familiar environments, but they experience difficulty in novel environments because they have an inability to learn about unfamiliar objects just by looking at them. So if you show a novel object and then a couple of seconds later you show them a bunch of objects including that novel object, they will not be able to select that novel object they previously saw. However, in contrast, they are able to recall auditory and tactile information that is novel, so they can, they can identify touch that is new. And damage to the parahippocampal gyrus on the right side is often associated with this condition. So the parahippocampal gyrus is next to the hippocampus. And then the last one I wanted to talk about are spatial distortions. So people can experience a variety of distortions in spatial perception. So for example, they can see themselves as too small or too large relative to their spatial world. So it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland and how she felt after she ate those magic cookies. So people can also have out of body experiences where they occupy a space at a distance from their own body or imagine that they have more than one body. So these are all spatial distortions. Okay, so here is a slide with um, a table with everything I technically just said. So we went over 
these four and spatial distortions. It's just not on here. So you have egocentric disorientation, often associated with the lesion of the posterior parietal cortex. And here patients are unable to represent the location of objects with respect to self. So in heading disorientation, often associated with the lesion of the posterior cingulate cortex. Here people are unable to represent direction of orientation with respect to environment. Landmark agnosia, often associated with lingu um, lingual gyrus. Here people are unable to represent appearance of prominent landmarks. And anterograde disorientation, often associated with the parahippocampal gyrus. And here people are unable to learn new representations of environmental information. So people with egocentric disorientations also have problem with mental rotations. So for example, rotating a dice in your head. Heading disorientation can be easily rem remembered by thinking of no sense of direction. And landmark agnosia, um, people can still recognize a church, but they can't use it to navigate. And with anterograde disorientation, they have difficulty in navigating in new areas, but not old environments. Okay, so historically we have two streams of processing our spatial information. So we have our dorsal stream, which is more on top, if you guys remember dorsal, is towards the top. And we have a ventral stream, which is towards the bottom. So both streams originate in the visual cortex or in the occipital lobe. The ventral stream projects um, through the temporal lobes and it is very important for identifying objects. So this pathway is termed the what pathway. So you need it for uh, identifying what an object is. The dorsal stream originates in the visual cortex and projects through the parietal lobes and this guides movement. So this uh, pathway is termed the wear pathway. So again, the dorsal pathway is the wear pathway and the ventral pathway is the what pathway. So in the end, all this information will come together in the prefrontal cortex and that's where all this information is combined. So researchers now segmented the, the dorsal stream in two components. So the idea is that information from the visual cortex projects to the parietal cortex and from there it then sends information to three sites. So either to the premotor cortex, the prefrontal cortex, and the medial temporal lobe. So instead of two streams, there are now three streams. So the premotor and parietal lobes organize visually guided actions. And the prefrontal and parietal lobes play a role in spatial navigation. And then the medial temporal and parietal lobes play a role in spatial memory. So patients with damage to the frontal lobes, they will fail to show any signs of vision even though their visual system is still intact. Premotor and motor cortices um, that are organizing movements and locomotions so for example, bringing your hand to the mouth or avoidance movements, that all comes from your premotor motor cortices. And then if the hand area of our motor cortex is disconnected to the visual centers, you will not be able to use your hands to locate and pick up food. Okay, so this was the last slide and this is the end of this video. And I will see you guys back soon for the next video.